So welcome to today's exciting lecture um, on special senses. And by special senses we're going to talk about vision, we're going to talk about hearing, smell and taste. And we're going to start off with vision. And basically today's going to be a very quick crash course for all of the senses. So starting off with that, let's take one eye. So we have an eye, we have a lens. And at the back of it we have a retina. So what has to happen, this entire thing that the eye sees has to be basically focused by the lens. And the image is basically shrunk. So all of that becomes that little bit over there. Actually in real life it's more like a millimeter, so it takes a whole world and squeezes it into a little millimeter space. Also it flips it left to right and also um, down uh, up. As you can see, in order to make the compression, ma compression maximal, it causes the image to swap sides. And ideally, it wants the, most of the image to land on the area called the phobia centralis. Phobia centralis. And this is where you've got the most of your photoreceptor cells, those cells that are specifically designed to catch light and convert it into a nerve signal, and then uh, send it along the nerves. So all throughout your retina, we have nerves, the beginnings of nerves, and they all send down their axons, and they send down their axons, well, they all join up to form the optic nerve, which then exits the retina. And over here, over the optic nerve, because it's all the axons all joining up in that area, things are so busy with those axons that there are actually no photoreceptor cells in that area. So this area over here is a blind spot. So strictly speaking, we have two blind spots in our peripheral vision, uh, but our brain sort of photoshops them out, so we're not really aware of them. Uh, but there are some tests that you can do to prove to yourself that you have a blind spot. You will see some tests and an actual test in the lecture notes just to prove to yourself that yes, you are blind in the spot. <laughs> okay, now regarding these photoreceptors that are scattered throughout the retina, but at the highest concentration in the phobia centralis, we divide them broadly into two main types. So photoreceptor cells, see this red design. And we have cones, and we have rods. Now uh, these are not the only receptor cells that we have that can convert light into nerve images. There are many different types of receptor cells, cells designed specifically to detect edges, detect depth, detect texture. Uh, but for the sake of this lecture, we're going to focus on these two main ones, and uh, leave uh, all the nitty gritty extra photoreceptor cells for those guys who specialize in ophthalmology. So rods, um, if we had to look at the cell shape, we've got our cell body, we've got our uh, terminal plate, and then we've got the actual photoreceptor part in and of itself, which makes a rod shape, hence it's called a rod, and it's filled with little membranes that are filled with a substance called rhodopsin. Also known as visual purple. I don't know purple, but let's use blue. And this rhodopsin is specifically designed to catch low uh, level light or low intensity light. Uh, so they're all active in, uh, uh, in the dark. There's only a little bit of light available. So they work for low light and they tend to see things in shades of gray. So when there's only a little bit of light um, in the room, um, you don't see all the colors, but you can still sort of make out the shapes in a sort of bluish grayish um, uh, image. That's because that's the only colors that the rods are able to uh, perceive. For colors, we need cones. So again, they have a cell body, the nucleus, and all the mechanisms. And instead of a rod, they have this funny pine cone type thing. 
and it has all these membrane enfoldings, and these enfoldings are filled with a substance called photopsin, also known as iodopsin. And they react to specific types of bright light. And there are three different types of these um, cone cells. One, two, three. And you've got your short wave um, cone cells, which are specifically designed to look at blue. You've got medium wave cone cells, which specifically look at green. And you've got your long wave cone cells, which are designed to specifically see the color red. So strictly speaking, we only have four different types of colors that we can see. Blue, green, red, and gray. And, and basically all the different colors that we see are, are basically generated by either detecting these primary colors or mixing and matching them to form new secondary colors by taking the different combinations. If you are missing one of the tones, uh, then you're going to end up being color blind. Most common being the red, green, color blindness, so whereas most of us, I'm sure, see these two as separate colors, a person with red green color blindness is going to actually see something more like that. They're going to look like the same color to them. The guy who created Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, is actually red green color blind. That's why he made Facebook blue. That's a color that he can see the best, and he wanted to make sure that Facebook looks the same to him as to uh, Facebook users. <laughs> Okay, so let's go a bit more in-depth into how the cones and rods work. Cones and rods basically always work in partnership with two cells, the bicolor cells and the ganglion cells. So, we have a rod. Underneath every photoreceptor cell is a bicolor cell. So it's bipolar, the tree just has two poles, so there's one pole, cell body, and then a terminal. And that's the bipolar cell. And underneath the bipolar cell, we have a ganglion cell. And this ganglion cell then sends an axon, which eventually becomes the optic nerve. Sometimes the ganglion cells also have the ability to detect light through a molecule called melanopsin. But uh, this doesn't contribute to vision. It's not able to send vision signals into your brain. Rather, it uses that uh, light detection ability to send signals uh, to your brain stem and then back to the pupil to regulate pupil size and also to um, stimulate pain sensation when there's a bright light in your brain. Uh, in your face, as it were. So what happens? We have, we're starting off with a rod, so we have a little bit of light coming in from the street light. Uh, it's midnight and you're walking in the street and there's only that source of light is that street light and there's only a little bit of light and it hits your uh, cone and it reacts with that for a dachshund. That's in those uh, in that uh, cone, in those uh, membranes, the membranous discs. And rhodopsin basically consists of cis retinol and a molecule of opsin bound together. Retinol is made from vitamin A, so vitamin A deficiency can present with visual disturbances, most commonly night blindness in the initial stages of vitamin A deficiency. So what happens is that light enters the, the rod, and this light is able, these molecules are quite sensitive to light. So even a little bit of light is going to cause this molecule to start vibrating, and then it's going to tear itself apart. It's going to tear itself to a free molecule of opsin, and a free molecule of what's called transretinol. And now this opsin begins a whole cascade of chain of events that we're not going to go into. It's a massive, long biochemical chain that I don't think is very clinically useful to know at your level. Suffice to 
say activates uh, cyclic GMP. So uh, that uh, speeds up certain metabolic processes in the rod and the bipolar cell, and ultimately the bipolar cell is going to secrete glutamate. It's got some vesicles over there, and it's going to dump glutamate. And that glutamate is then going to stimulate the ganglion and send a signal to the brain. So I want you to think of that rod and the bipolar cell as functioning as a unit. In the presence of a little bit of light, that rod is going to cause a cascade of chain reactions, which is going to end up causing the bipolar cell to secrete glutamate. Somewhat similar process for the cones. Let's draw a cone. So in this case, we've got much brighter light coming in. You see now walking in the street during the day. And we also have a molecule called cis. Well, we have photopsin, and photopsin consists of cis retinol plus something called photopsin. And there are three types of photopsin. There's photopsin 1, photopsin 2, photopsin 3. And that was short, medium, and long wave photopsin. And a similar process happens here. These guys break apart. The photopsin then causes a cascade of chemical reactions leading to stimulation of the underlying bipolar cell, which leads to stimulation of the underlying ganglion. It's usually glutamate. Um, there are some articles discussing the role of dopamine and serotonin in the retina, but so they seem to, there are occasionally other neurotransmitters, but they don't seem to be main neurotransmitters, and the role isn't as quite clear yet. Um, so for now, we say that glutamate is 99% of the time the excitatory molecule. Okay, so now that we've activated this uh, ganglion, we need to know where does it go or how does it get into the brain. The see people are still scribbling, so let's give them a chance to finish. Okay, the scribblers are done. Okay, now when, you think, when, real, when talking about the, the way that the eye is wired towards the brain, you need to understand the concept of visual fields. We're going to keep it simple, and we're just going to assume that we have a person with just one eye. And everything that this eye sees is basically swapped left and right. But not only that, the way that the retina works is that it actually divides the left half and the right half of the retinal uh, input and sends it to different parts of the brain. So we have to actually divide our sort of visual field into a left and right um, side. So we have a left visual field and a right visual field. Now, as if I close my one eye, everything sort of towards the left is one visual field, and everything towards the right is another visual field. The left visual field ends up sitting on the right side of the retina, and the right visual field ends up on the left side of the retina because the image swaps, uh, swaps around. And this has a lot of consequences regarding the, the neural nervous system tract that a specific piece of imagery is going to take towards the brain. Sticking to the left side for now, everything on the left side of the retina is going to end up going to the left side of the brain. So it enters, becomes the optic nerve, it then goes to the optic chiasm, and then it goes to the left thumbs. It synapses with the lateral geniculate body. Some fibers will end up going to the superior colliculus. 
control various visual vision related reflexes. The rest will then go to the occipital lobe right at the back of the brain. To become visual imagery and then from the occipital lobe there's then um, pathways going towards the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe so we can think about what we see and understand what we see in terms of uh, 3D uh, relationships and also decide what we, how we feel about what we see. Sorry? Yes. Which part? Yes. Okay, so everything from the right visual field will end up on the left side of the retina. Alright? And that visual image is then going to go join up with the optic nerve. That optic nerve then goes to a structure called the optic chiasm. And at that point, the nerves branch out to different parts of the brain. The left side, the, this pathway for the right visual field is going to stick to the left, the, the left hemisphere. So it goes to the left thalamus. And then from the left thalamus, it goes to the uh, left occipital lobe. So our left occipital lobe is responsible for the right visual field. Regarding the opposite visual field, the left visual field ends up on the right side of the retina. And that's also going to join up with the optic nerve and it's going to go to the optic chiasm. And at the optic chiasm, it's going to split uh, from its body over there. And it's instead going to go on to the opposite side. And it's going to synapse at the thalamus at the pulvinar nucleus. And then it's going to go to the occipital lobe on that side. In other words, the left visual field is processed by the right hemisphere occipital lobe. So as a rule of thumb, right visual field will always end up in the left occipital lobe. Left visual field will always end up in the right occipital lobe. We'll see that, uh, that that rule stays true of the opposite eye. Let's assume that our eyes are squint and that we're looking in two different directions. So we said um, left visual field is going to end up in the right side of the hemisphere. So let's have a look if that's still true. We've got the left retina over the, the right retina catching the left uh, visual field, joins up with, at the optic nerve, goes to the optic chiasm, it's a bit far over here, and then sorry, I got the wrong moment. Yeah, left side goes to the right one, so it's, I'm gonna end up staying on this side. <laughs> Changes it to the mechanical vibration, 
then changes it into fluid vibration, and then you're going to get uh, a nerve signal. So let's go through everything step by step. So we have a nice big ear over here, and an ear canal. So someone is busy shouting into your ear, and the sound waves are picked up by the pinna and go into your ear canal. And at the end of the ear canal is a tympanic membrane, otherwise known as the ear drum. And drum is a good word for it because as that sound wave knocks against that uh, tympanic membrane, that tympanic membrane is then going to start to vibrate. That vibration is then going to be transferred to a little bone called the malleus. Which in and of itself is then going to transfer itself to another bone called the incus. And then the final bone in this step is the stapes. So we start off with a sound wave going through air, changes into mechanical vibration of the tympanic membrane, and then that, that mechanical vibration is transmitted through these three bones. And notice that the bones get smaller and smaller as we go along. That basically concentrates the mechanical vibration until we finally hit something called the oval window. And that oval window starts to vibrate. And at the other end of the oval window, we have the cochlea, which I'm going to attempt to very badly draw now. So that is my extremely bad drawing of the cochlea, but it will have to do. Um, so in this cochlea, we have two ducts. We have the vestibular duct. and a cochlea duct. And they are filled with fluid, a um, specific special type of fluid referred to as perilymph, peri which is very similar in composition to lymph fluid. And the vibration at this oval window is then going to knock against the fluid and cause fluid vibrations going up and into the cochlea. Now what this vibration wants to do, it wants to cross over the cochlear duct to the opposite vestibular duct and then escape out the round window. And that's what happens to most sounds. They go through the cochlea and as soon as they can get out, they get out. So in this cochlear duct, there are now specialized types of um, uh, structures called the organs of corti, and as the sound waves or as the fluid waves move from one duct to the other, crossing the cochlear duct, these organs are then activated and cause sounds uh, to be transmitted to the brain. I'll show you a picture of how that works just now. The other thing to realize is that this, uh, there's a membrane in the cochlear duct that starts off quite thick at the beginning. And it becomes very thin at the, at the end, it's called the basal membrane. Because it's quite thick at the beginning, only low frequency sounds are able to cross over at the beginning. And only, the high frequency sounds can only cross over right at the end of the cochlea. Which is not terribly important to know unless you're going to be installing um, cochlear implants, because implants are designed to have specific frequencies at a specific area of the uh, cochlea. Let's wait for everyone to finish scribbling. Scribble away, my minions. <laughs>
And at the bottom of this copy of doc, we have something called the base of our membrane. And then it gives off almost like a little bit of a roof for the tectorial membrane. And underneath this roof-like structure of the tectorial membrane, we have um, hair cells, so-called because they have little cilia on top, and these cilia are referred to as stereo cilia. And then right underneath the hair cells is um, a nerve just waiting to be stimulated and send the signal towards the brain. So what happens? Ready now, fluid goes from one from the top vestibular duct and it tries to escape the cochlea. And as it um, moves from one vestibular duct to the other, crossing through the cochlea duct, these waves literally basically hit the tectorial membrane and they cause it to vibrate. And as they hit the tectorial membrane, the tectorial membrane um, basically goes down and then knocks against the stereocilia. And when the stereocilia bend, uh, depolarization occurs in these hair cells and neurotransmitters are released uh, to stimulate the underlying neuron and then the signal is fired off. So now different parts of the cochlea are designed to pick up different types of frequencies. Um, so with a specific frequency, such as the frequency of my speech, you're only going to have the specific organs of 40 in the cochlea being stimulated and therefore you'll only hear those sounds being created. Just going to close the door. So I can't hear myself talk about hearing. Yeah, now you are trapped. Okay, so that's how the stereocilia activates. They, uh, that, that's how they activate the underlying neuron. And now how does the signal then get to the brain? So let's have a look at the brain. We've got our mandala alongata, our palms, midbrain, hypothalamus, thalamus. Okay, so these signals, all those nerves coming out of the organs of 40 are eventually going to join up together to form the cochlear nerve. The cochlear nerve then joins the vestibular nerve, which is responsible for balance and to form the uh, vestibular cochlear nerve, otherwise known as cranial nerve 8. And this cranial nerve then synapses in the pons at the cochlear nucleus. So at that point, it then, the signal then has to be uh, pushed up, and it goes up to the top of the uh, pons to the superior olivary nucleus. So let's say this is all coming out of right here. At this point there's decussation. So there's some decussation to the opposite superior olivary nucleus. And then we go up again to the inferior pelliculus, which then localizes the sound in three-dimensional space and also is responsible for some reflexes involved um, uh, regarding um, hearing. From here and here, there's some feedback going back to the ear. There's some muscles controlling the tension of those uh, bones in the ear and also the tympanic membrane. So there is some ability to slacken or tighten the tension on the tympanic membrane uh, in order to adjust uh, uh, for hearing. There's decussation again over here. And then the signals go up to the thalamus and then they go to the auditory cortex on the superior border of the temporal lobe. But there's the cassation, so it's also going to go to the other side. What this means basically is that both um, hemispheres are responsible for hearing for the one ear. So signals from 
The left ear will go to both to the right and left hemisphere. The signals from the opposite ear will go to both hemispheres, which is why it's so unusual to have deafness as a symptom of stroke. Uh, because even if you wipe out the one auditory cortex on the one side, um, the other auditory cortex is still receiving signals from that ear, so that you can still hear. The only real way to knock out hearing from an ear is to have an uh, infarction or, or damage to the cochlear nucleus. So obviously it then also goes on the opposite side, and it becomes like that as well. This is a question in the test, by the way. It's <laughs> <laughs> a trick question. So 
for all the 10 to 20 million olfactory nerves, they all sign up to the olfactory bulb. This olfactory bulb then goes off and has a direct connection to the uh, primary olfactory cortex, which if we draw the brain here, will be on the medial side of the temporal lobe. So it's interesting that this sense of, uh, the sense of smell does not go through the thalamus. Pretty much every, most input going to the brain has to go via the thalamus, but the sense of smell is unique. It bypasses the thalamus and goes straight to the temporal lobe. From the temporal lobe, there's direct connections to the frontal lobe, so we can decide what, uh, what we think about uh, what we are smelling. There's a direct con uh, connection to the limbic system. So we instantly tend to have an emotion with certain types of smells, and there's also a connection to the insula, which uh, decides whether you're smelling food, and if you're smelling food, it then tells you, gosh, it's time to eat. Which is why the smell of food can make you salivate. Now, not all smells are covered by cranial nerve 1. This is basically the beginning of cranial nerve 1. Some smells are actually controlled by the trigeminal nerve, which is cranial nerve 5. And these are smells that, in high concentrations, can be actually quite painful uh, to experience. So, the four known smells that are actually picked up by cranial nerve 5 are the smell of ammonia, the smell of menthol, the smell of chlorine, and the smell of capsicum or chili pepper. So these four smells are not detected by cranial nerve 1, they're actually detected by cranial nerve 5, which has all, which has a receptor scattered throughout the uh, nasal mucosa, the pharynx, and the mouth. And that was a brief tour of how smell works. And now we're going to go on to taste as soon as the scribblers are not scribbling. Each. 
and the fungi form about five taste buds each. And each taste bud then has a clustering of taste cells. So looking at a taste bud, a taste bud will consist of some support cells, <coughs> We've got one taste bud sitting on our, uh, one of our papillae. We've got some basal cells, so we've got support cells or sustentacula, sustentacula. And we've got basal, which are actually um, stem cells because uh, taste buds are constantly dying off and constantly be regenerated, just like olfactory nerves. And then we have the actual taste cells sort of crammed in here like little bananas almost. And these taste cells have cilia on top of them. And these cilia have receptors, uh, specifically for sour or sweet or bitter. And when a molecule that has that property activates one of the receptors, but then causes depolarization, which allows activation of the underlying nerves. And sends a signal to the brain. Now, these, this type of depolarization is unique in that most of the taste sensations um, do not use a neurotransmitter to connect, uh, to con communicate with the underlying nerve. Most of them communicate by releasing ATP directly into the uh, synaptic cavity, and that ATP then directly stimulates depolarization in the underlying nerve. The exception being the sour taste, the sour taste uses serotonin as a neurotransmitter to uh, activate the underlying nerve. In fact, we haven't discovered the receptor yet, so we're still not sure exactly what neurotransmitter that, that uses. And the reason that that's important is because you're going to be prescribing antidepressants probably at some point. Antidepressants alter the balance of serotonin in the body, and often people or some medications complain of strange tastes in their mouths, and that's partly due to interference with that neurotransmitter in the tongue. Okay, so we have a tastant molecule. So in the nose we have odorants, in the mouth we have tastants, they have to dissolve in water and then go to the taste bud and then uh, react with the cilia. If your mouth is dry, you can't taste anything because the taste molecules are not able to dissolve and go towards that uh, taste bud. And then the signals have to be sent from the brain. So I've mentioned that we have taste receptors all over the palate and the epiglottis. Uh, information from that area will go towards the brain via cranial nerve 8 or the vagus nerve. The posterior third of the tongue goes via a uh, glossopharyngeal nerve, which is cranial nerve 9. And the anterior two thirds goes via cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve. And then off they go to the brain. Okay, let me just let the people finish scribbling. And then I can take off the slide. Looks like everyone's more or less done. Okay, so they go towards the brain and they all sign up at the same place despite being three different nerves. They all sign up to the medulla of Golgata, specifically for the brain here. There's a nucleus called the solitary tract nucleus. And they're all synapse all up to this. So that's 7, 10, and 9. And they're all synapse at that nucleus. And it's relatively simple after that. It goes all the way straight to the thalamus. Where part of it then splits up. Part of it goes to the insular lobe. And then the rest of the signal goes to the post central gyrus. 
the insular level then uh, decide whether we're hungry or not and how good the food tastes in terms of how we're hungry. Um, that's why food tends to taste better when you're feeling hungry because it's uh, insular upregulates those taste signals coming in and the central gyrus is responsible for interpreting that and making us aware of the taste. Now there is a bit of a uh, funny part over here in the sense that there's variable patterns of depassation that can occur. So some people, the right side of the tongue is going to go to the right hemisphere, it's going to stay ipsilateral. In some people, there's going to be a lot of depassation. So it's going to go to the opposite side of the brain, meaning that uh, both sides of the brain control both sides of the tongue. And in some people, perhaps, there's even complete decussation. But in general, on average, uh, most people have a bit of ipsilateral dominance, uh, but with a, enough decussation that you, if you had to have an infarct of the tongue area on the white side of the brain, you won't lose sensation on the whole tongue, um, because the other part of the brain can pick up the slack. Although some people do not have that decussation, so an infarct will actually cause them to lose taste in the one part of the tongue. There was an interesting case a few years back seen by one of my colleagues of a person with a brainstem tumor that actually affected the solitary tract nucleus and he was complaining of this horrible metallic taste in his tongue all the time and he went to the ENT and specialists and all that and by the time someone decided to do a brain scan to pick up the brainstem tumor it was pretty much too late to do anything about it, it was too big. So please uh, remember your neurophysiology. And the patient is having funny symptoms of the tongue. <laughs>